I got the interweb plugged in. We should be on the line now. This is TWIS, This Week in Science, episode 462, recorded on the 1st of May, 2014. Title of today's show, Girls vs. Boys. Today we will fill your head with much science, but first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer! Across much of the northern hemisphere, spring has sprung. A new year of science is blossoming! The seeds of hypotheses previously planted in the minds of researchers are sprouting up everywhere. From garden variety cosmology to farm town physics, from landscape laboratories to greenhouse climatology, knowledge is growing, greening and blooming like never before. A May Day basket of flowering findings for us all up ahead on This Week in Science, coming up next. And this is the part where we pretend to dance because there would be bumper music, which will be edited in later. Hooray. Yeah. Good <laughs> science, Stu Blair. Good science to you, Justin. Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of This Week in Science. Today, we have a great show ahead. On this week's show, we have so much. I have speedy mites. I have deep diving sea lions and seals. I have migration. I have stress release. I have bees. I have cartwheeling spiders. I have so many things. I just don't think we have enough time for all of it. What do you have, Justin? I have brain cancer. Girly Do you really? Girl. No. no. <laughs> girl, I have grades like a girl, meander noggins, Mars marshes, and thinking with your teeth. Ah. Well, let's jump right into this, Justin. What do you got? Okay, so uh, the first story I, I think we're gonna, I'm going to do here is Neanderthals. i got to do this Neanderthal uh, story first because it's echoing something we were talking about a mere two weeks ago. There's the widely held notion that Neanderthals were less cognitively able to function than us. They were our dim-witted, inferior intelligent cousins, even though, even though, even though they had bigger brains, and even though they existed for 300 plus thousand years before modern man is thought to have really existed. So, you know, they had a good run. They've had a better run than we've had so far. And if mankind makes it another 300,000 years, we can pass them. But we'll see. Uh, but this is, uh, part of it, too, is the idea that our, our interjection into their area, our coming to, upon the scene in Eurasia, accelerated their demise somehow. But this is not supported by scientific evidence, according to a study in the open access journal PLOS One by Paolo Vila from the University of Colorado Museum and Will Robrokes from Leiden University, Netherlands. For over 300,000 years, populations of Neanderthals lived across Eurasia. Then suddenly, about 40,000 years ago, they were gone. Though not so suddenly, perhaps, and as we now know, not gone entirely. There is Neanderthal DNA in the modern human genome. <clears throat> Popular assumption has been new humans, us modern humans with our cell phones and indoor plumbing, outperformed our Neander cousins into extinction because of our vastly superior intelligence. In the studies, scientists some, uh, systematically tested the strengths of some of the archaeologically derived explanations for Neander extinction such as their supposed lack of a complex language, inferior capacity for innovation, inferior hunting abilities. They had smaller social networks. They were very isolated, so if a problem went wrong in a small community, it was thought that would possibly end that entire, uh, end to have a, a collapse of population in tiny pockets, more susceptible than, to that than uh, our larger populations, as well as other potential environmental explanations, including harsh climate, volcanic eruptions, all sorts of things that went on. Researchers have shown that Neanderthals likely, though, herded hundreds of bison to their death by steering them into a sinkhole in southwestern France. <laughs> Another site, uh, this one is in the Channel Islands, fossilized remains of 18 mammoths, five woolly mammoth rhinoceros, or woolly rhinoceroses, were discovered at the base of a steep ravine. 
These findings together imply that Neanderthals could plan ahead, they could work as a group, communicate with one another in order to drive these animals off cliffs to their deaths so that they would be much easier to, to eat. Uh, other archaeological evidence unearthed at Neanderthal sites pr provides reason to believe that Neanderthals did in fact have a diverse diet. This is one of the things that was, has been sort of assumed. They lived on this all-meat diet. They hunted, they ate what they hunted, and that was it. Microfossils found in Neander teeth and food remains left behind at cooking sites, as they did cook, they had fire, they cooked, indicate that they may have eaten wild peas, acorns, pistachios, grass seeds, wild olives, pine nuts, date palms, basically whatever was food uh, available locally was, was on the plate. Additionally, researchers found okra, uh, a, a earth pigment, uh, sites inhabited by Neanderthals, which may have been used for body painting. Hmm. Ornaments have been collected at Neanderthal sites. Uh, we know that they took special care now in burying their young, much more so more offering sort of more things in the grave site than on uh, older. So they, they did have strong emotional connections to their young and ritual that went along with it. So you take all of these things together, indicates perhaps there was ability to communicate, uh, symbolic communication, symbolism. We, you know, don't go as far here as saying a written language, anything of that nature, but able to communicate uh, pretty well. Researchers say that the past misrepresentation of Neanderthal's cognitive ability may be linked to the tendency of researchers to compare Neanderthals who lived in the Middle Paleolithic to more modern humans living during uh, the upper Paleolithic period in which leaps of technology were being made. If, if the Neanderthal record is compared only to that of African Middle Stone Age human contemporaries instead of the more modern humans that succeeded them, the, the differences begin to evaporate. In fact, they're too small to explain demise in terms of cognitive or behavioral inferiority. Instead, the authors argue, genetic data recently obtained from Neanderthal skeletal remains suggests that complex and drawn-out process of interbreeding and assimilation may have been responsible for the disappearance of the specific Neanderthal morphology in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. So it is more likely, according to this research, an act of assimilation mm -hmm. that did away with the distinction of Neanderthals. Uh, also, it is potential, there is potential that crossbreeding uh, between the then modern human and Neanderthal uh, may have left males, may have created uh, fertility issues. So, a lot of the early hybrids may not have been uh, as well represented going forward. They were used yeah. to having smaller social groups, so maybe they had less children. There's a lot of questions as mm. to why uh, it's not more represented in the population from genetic code. But on the other hand, this is a long time ago. There have been plenty of generations, and there were less of them uh, to begin with. So, it may not require all of those those things to take place. But yeah, we, we also have learned, you know, that they have less of a proclivity or m have genes turned off that when turned on in modern humans leads to things like autism, schizophrenia. Uh, they, they may have had less of those, uh, those difficulties in their society. And they had bigger brains, right? So which, which is the correlative from the study we did last week of having, at least as it was defined in that study, more self-control. Mm-hmm. They may, they may have just been wise, sagely. <laughs> and that killed them. Being too and smart killed them. And that's why, because yeah. the impulsive, neurotic, schizophrenic modern human came along and ruined everything. Mm -hmm. Yep. They uh, absorbed them and killed them. That's mm -hmm. what they did. <laughs> we, we mated them off the planet. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, oh, this is, uh, this is the second story I'm going to delve right into here. Quick question, quick question, pop quiz. Do not overthink what I'm about to ask, as there is no wrong answer to this. Simply answer the question. 
the moment I ask it. Answer it to yourself okay. while you're listening in the chat room. Everybody get ready. Here is the question. Ready? Who is better at math, boys or girls? Go. Uh. <laughs> now, 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 just answer right away. Don't overthink it. What was the first answer that came to your mind? First answer that came to your mind. Neither. Oh, <laughs> you, you covered, but you didn't answer right away. So chances are, even if you refuse to answer this question, <laughs> that most of you... I know the answer. You, That's why I couldn't respond. Most of you thought of the stereotypical answer first. Boys. Boys have, traditionally speaking, traditionally speaking, done much better at math than girls have, at least traditionally speaking. But if you look at traditional actuality... <laughs> A different reality than the traditional speaker's version would be revealed. This is uh, from the American Psychological Association, comes this story. Despite the stereotype, girls get higher grades than boys throughout their education. This recent development in uh, female educational su superiority has been going on for nearly a century. <laughs> so the reason that people think that boys are better at science and math is that they do better in the standardized testing, right? They 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 do. They do a little bit better in the standardized testing. But uh, who wrote the test? <laughs> yeah, it was Men. done. It was done from from a male perspective of yes. the math, and therefore yep. no. Now there there may be other reasons for this. There have been lots of studies on gender bias and standardized testings. Oh, okay. Lots. Okay. Yeah. I, I wouldn't know. Uh, but yeah, this is for just about as long as we have decent recorded data to look at. Girls have gotten better grades than boys. Now, you might be thinking that's, you know, uh, development of United in the United States, women's rights, this, that, the other. So this is based on research from 1914 through 2011. And it spanned more than 30 different countries. The bulk of it, the bulk of it did come from the United States. 70% of the data was from the United States. 30% though, 30% uh, was everywhere from Norway to New Zealand, uh, Mexico, Iran, India. It was all over, right? Places all in between there. The, the complete study reflected the grades of 438 over 438,000 boys and over 495,000 girls. So we got about a million uh, individuals sampled throughout this near century of time. Uh, all studies included an evaluation of gender differences and teacher assigned grades or official grade point averages in elementary, junior, middle, or high school, undergraduate, and graduate university. Study reveals that boys lagging behind girls in school achievement is not only normal, it's consistent around across time around the globe. It's been that way for a very long time. Uh, let's see. The fact that females generally perform better than their male counterparts throughout what is essentially mandatory schooling in most countries seems to be a well-kept secret considering how little attention it has received as a global phenomenon says co-author Susan Boyer, who happens to be female. So that's really, isn't that interesting? So yeah, there is, there, there's points at which, by the time you get to junior high school, it's pretty much across the board, all subjects, math, science, literature. The gaps are bigger in language-oriented literature, history, that sort of thing. They're narrower, girls have a narrower lead on boys in math and science, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still a lead. And it is interesting because when it gets to the point of leaving high school, everything narrows up. It gets very close uh, on the math, where it's almost the same. And boys do perform better uh, statistically on a standardized testing, mm -hmm. which is interesting. So I definitely think the testing has to do with test engineering gender bias. I think mm -hmm. I strongly believe that. Um, but when it comes to I, school... I think it's pretty interesting that I know there have been a lot of studies on um, brain development in males and females, mm. and the fact that things like intentions, uh, attention span and 
um, self-awareness and those kinds of things develop much later in males than in females and in fact the male brain develops for many years after than female brains do. I think the female brain stops developing in the early 20s I want to say and the males go to mid or late 20s in their brain development. Hmm. So if that if that all has been substantiated and is definitely true which I've I think I've read studies about it, but I also saw it on Nova maybe 10 years ago, so I'm going to need to fact check myself on that one. But if that's true, that definitely makes a lot of sense in relation to how they're performing in school and their ability to stay to constraints that a classroom has. Hmm. I think that that has a lot to do with it. Um, but I think, I don't know. I. I wonder, there's a lot of different things at play here, um, but especially when you're looking at high school, I think it's very interesting that they narrow towards the end there, mm -hmm. and I wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that at least for the first three quarters of this study, because it was done starting in, the in 1914, right, you said? Correct. That for the first many decades of this study, most women were told that they shouldn't go to college or that they had some other sort of thing to do in college other than science or math or something more heady. So is that why it tapers off or does it taper off because male and female brains kind of even out in their functionality as they reach 18? Right. It could be, it could be developmental uh, stages are, are different, you know, between the sexes and that could explain some of it. Um, you know, I, one of the things I thought about in the narrowing, though, was uh, was something we've covered here in the past, which is there's stigmas attached to girls doing math or mm -hmm. being good at math that probably don't really start becoming stigmas until somewhere around high school. So it may not be that the boys are catching up so much as the girls are are taking focus away from math. Mm -hmm. not considered as they're sort of becoming uh, more gender role defined I guess I don't know what that's probably not what it is exactly but there could be um, there could be a, a, a sort of walking back what their normal interest was uh, in doing that subject yeah and um, somebody in the chat room had asked wouldn't non-test grades be biased by the teachers? Well, I think that especially with science and math, mm -hmm. if you're looking at a class grade based on exams, I think that is what is not so biased. And when we say non-test grades, you're talking about grades, they still are derived from tests in a classroom, but they're not the standardized testings that are statewide or countrywide, right? So. It's it still it still has a rubric. It's still very systematic. It's still as non-biased as you can get with this kind of stuff. <laughs> but it's not the standardized test that everybody has to take with the Scantron and the, all of that stuff. Um, but I think that a lot of people in the chat room also are bringing up a really good point, which is, if this is true, why are there so few women in math and science? So which... here's here's the other thing. Here's what's also okay. So. So I was thinking about that, um, and I was, and I just kind of was looking around trying to get some statistics, and I, I happened upon Wikipedia's uh, Wikipedia, and and it, it, it maybe you know it didn't break it down to the discipline, but the number of master's degrees, uh, number of doctorates, right? Uh, this is as of 2005-2006 is dead even, 50-50 men and women, right? Uh, the number of masters and associates degrees, though, is like 60-40 women. So, so women are getting more a higher percentage of the advanced degrees than than the men. Mm -hmm. So it may not be, you know, we say there's not women in this, that, the other, but I'm not, I'm not actually convinced that's true anymore. I'm not really sure, you know, and, and part of it could be again. There may be there may be a social stigma in high school mm -hmm. about the the math girl uh, that being something that you know that may not be the teacher's fault, maybe 
maybe maybe it's something rooted in the students. I don't know. Maybe it's a developmental thing. I have no idea why. But maybe there is something that does turn girls off of pursuing math and science as a career. But again, I don't know that that's true. I don't have anything statistically to, yeah. to back that up or, or take it away. Well, anecdotally, I do know that when I was in high school, there were lots of there was lots of pressure coming at me, and I don't want to say where it came from or how I got this impression because I can't remember. It was a long time ago now, but I do remember thinking that boys don't like smart girls. But I eventually decided, and we, and who we cares? Just, right, right. We, yeah. <laughs> But ultimately, I do remember having that thought and having conversations about that, that right. boys are turned off by a girl that's too smart. Right, right. The, well, there are guys who are turned Not off a woman's by place. smart girls. But, but <laughs> those, are, those are the ones you want to avoid anyway. So yeah. it, was, it was nature's warning sign. It's, I think all of this is, is in the last hundred years and now moving forward, hopefully we're seeing a tip of the scales and we're seeing a change in the trends that we saw before. Hopefully there will be less social pressure to not be smart if you're a woman. There will be more support of women in math and science. This is what we're hoping for. I do think we are starting to see it more. So hopefully that's just going to continue and it will reflect these things that you're talking about much more. Yeah, especially because if you look at the statistics, girls have been outperforming boys in school for as long as they've been recording this. So I don't know... <laughs> Like, that would have kind of limited your options, I think, if you were looking for a girl that wasn't that smart. Like, right? Mm -hmm. like, that would be that would make it harder to find a date to the school prom. Uh. <laughs> yeah, now, I don't know. Now I'm kind of curious. Now I want to, I want to see if, if, if there are really more men in science than women. Because I thought that, I thought, you know, I'm not for sure boys were just better at math, just generally speaking. You know, or at least, not that they were better, but that they over, like, if, if I was to say over 100 years, who's traditionally got the best grades in math, I would have assumed boys, not because I really thought one would be better than the other. I actually didn't expect there to be any difference. Um, but I would have assumed that boys would have been perhaps more expected to do well, more encouraged to do well, uh, over, you know, going back a hundred years, and that there will be more focus in teaching boys math and science from the prejudice of a uh, teaching system, but that doesn't seem to be the case at all. Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, hopefully, we'll see whether that's true or not. We'll see even an even keel in these subjects in the future. And those two took a while. Why don't we uh, why don't we switch gears and let's go let's go to that place that place that we go to each show, uh -huh. ladies and gentlemen, uh -huh. Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. So speaking of males and females in science, this is the perfect segue to one of my favorite stories this week, which is that whether it's a male or a female researcher. That could confound your data. What? Yeah. So in a recent study um, where they were injecting an irritant into mice to test t pain response, which is a whole other questionable thing going on, <laughs> um, they found some weird responses. It didn't make a whole lot of sense. And they we're wondering if there was something weird going on with the study and what they found was first of all this is what this is the first step they thought okay the animals appear to respond differently when researchers are present so this was way back in 2007 um, they observed that mice spend less time licking a painful injection when a person is nearby and so they started putting different people out there reading books next to the mice At one point they even put a cardboard cutout of Paris Hilton there that helps you to date the study way back to 2007 <laughs> and so then they started to wonder if it was related to perhaps to something else so they took a closer look the researchers 
again injected an inflammatory agent into the foot of a rat or a mouse and then took a seat nearby to read the book. Video camera trained on the rodent's face looked at the animal's face to assess the pain level based on a 0 to 2 grimace scale, which is pretty standard. You can look at a lot of animals, specifically mammals, and you can gauge pain based on the expression on their face. And the results were fairly mixed. Sometimes the animals showed pain to what they expected it to be, and sometimes they didn't show pain at all. So then they decided, let's control whether it's a male or a female researcher that was present. Well, the rodent showed significantly fewer signs of pain, on average about 36% lower score on the grimace scale when it was a male researcher in the room. When there was a female researcher in the room, or no researcher at all, it was the res they got the results they expected. So then they wondered if they were responding to the sight or something else more subtle. So then they had these researchers place a worn t-shirt near the injected animal and leave the room. Even when the humans weren't present, rats and mice showed about a 36%, again, lower score on the grimace scale when there was a male t-shirt rather than a female t-shirt. Hmm. And then when they put both a male and a female t-shirt next to each other, there was no impact. So this means that now I'm confused. An, an odor of a male yeah. makes the rat or mouse grimace less, show less pain. So, but wait, wait, wait. The, the last one got me. The, if they put the male and a female shirt there, it cancels uh, out? Yeah. So this makes sense because if you're thinking about being an animal in the wild, if there is a male, a solitary male, he's either hunting, defending his territory, or looking for a mate. If you're in pain and you show weakness, you're dinner. <laughs> you're in trouble. So if there's a female there, the male is not solitary, the male's probably occupied with a female, not a concern to you. But if the male is hunting or looking for territory, then you don't want to look like you're in pain because you're showing weakness and putting a target on your back from this male. So the question is, <laughs> what now? After all of the research that has be do been done forever <laughs> right. with mice and rats, when is this confounding? When is this a problem for the research? And when is it not? Because it looks like having male laboratory assistants and male researchers could be problematic around these mammals. And do they affect other mammals? Do they affect monkeys? Do they affect rabbits? We don't know. Hmm. So, so yeah, uh, we, the assumption then is that the they're faking it? They're faking. Mm -hmm. it. They're hi yeah. trying to hide their pain. Mm -hmm. Not that they find a strong male role model comforting. Correct. Which <laughs> they were able to figure out by testing their urine. They saw stress hormones. The stress hormones are still there. Wow. This that's fascinating. I. So this does not mean if you're in pain and you're female, you should have a male near you <laughs> to kill the pain. That's not what this means. Were these male mice? They Across the board, males and females. Really? Yeah. Because I could so, see the male mouse being like, you know, uh, I can handle it, bro. Yeah, that's nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah, what, that's all you got? You know, but... Uh. Yeah, so... so wait, uh, males are, now males are a threat to nature? Nature is afraid of us? Yeah. Mammals, no. Male mammals are trouble. Hmm. Specifically male predator mammals. That could be trouble. But so now, of course, the question is, do we fire all male scientists? <laughs> Wait, what? I'm kidding. It's fine. We'll just <laughs> have to figure out a way. Maybe scientists working on anything related to stress or pain with lab animals have to wear 
some sort of suit or spray themselves down with it, some sort of scent. I don't know. They got to spray they themselves with a, a, with a lady smell. Mm -hmm. Yep. Put on a, a t-shirt a lady was wearing. I don't know. We'll have to see. This is something that I don't know if it's enough to cause problems across the board or if there's just certain studies left to be really careful. I don't know. But hey, Blair, I mean, I'm yeah. about to run an experiment. Take off uh -huh. your shirt. It's for science. Right. It's okay. It's for science. I need your shirt. Right. Would mm -hmm. you take it off for me, please? It's nope. <laughs> no, thanks, though. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, mites. Mites are the fastest animal on land. So a uh, species what? of mite. Yeah, what? species of no. mite. No, I'm sure that I'm faster than a mite. Paratarsotomus macropalpus is the size of a sesame seed, uh, and it is... It goes 322 body lengths per second. So this is relative speed. So you probably are faster than this might if you both started at the same starting line. Probably win the hundred. Uh, probably win the, the the one yard dash as well. Right. The previous record holder was the Australian tiger beetle, which went at 171 body lengths per second. Um, by comparison, a cheetah going 60 miles per hour only goes 16 body lengths a second. Um, and this guy shattered the previous record by almost twice as fast, 322 body lengths per second. If you look at the size of a human and you extrapolate that, that would be as though you were running 1,300 miles per hour. Woo! 1,300 miles per hour. That's the equivalent of how fast these guys go. And they're found in Southern California, these mites. And it's interesting not only because this is a new world record, but it also reveals a whole new glimpse into the physiology of movement and physical limitations of living structures. Because, again, this guy has shattered the record of how fast a land animal could be. Do we, do we have any indication of... Why he requires this sort of speed, or is it just, or is it just a facility of the size and physics of the universe of that scale being such that you can move your, you can propel yourself greatly with less so, energy? So, part of it is that relative speed and stride frequency increase as animals get smaller. Yeah. Muscle physiology should eventually limit how fast a leg can move, but apparently this might has figured out a way around that. And so they're trying to find if there is an upper limit. So these things run over rocks and sand and stuff in Southern California. And part of the reason potentially that they would have to go so fast is that the concrete where they run on can get up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And they can run on it and it doesn't hurt their feet. So that is also a much higher upper lethal temperature than most animals. So not only are they the fastest thing we've ever seen, but they can withstand some of the hottest temperatures we've ever seen. The question is why exactly? That's what they're still trying to figure out. Um, so they can also stop and change directions really fast. And so now they want to a, figure out bioengineering applications from this mite, but B, they want to study it more in its own habitat to figure out, yes, if there's a reason that it has to go exactly that fast. Well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take down the, the uh, big top on my flea circus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I think I'm going to have to go with the mite circus from now on. Yeah. The might, mighty Olympics. I don't know if you could hold them in, though. I don't even know. I don't know how big a mite is. I just assume I can't see it with with eyes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and one more really quick one before the break, and then I have more animal stories for after the break too. Don't worry. But stress therapy dogs. Well, they relieve stress in humans. There's been lots of studies about that. But they about, create stress in cats. I'm sure it could. What this study looked at for the first time was if it creates stress for the dogs. Oh. 
Good question, right? <laughs> if these dogs are going to see addicts and people with deficiencies and mental acuity problems and all these kinds of things, is that stressing these dogs out going into these new environments, meeting all these new people, being pet by all these different people all the time? Is it stressing out the therapy dogs? I'm picturing no one the dog ask. I'm picturing the dog like on the on the couch, you know. My my human he's just so needy. He's just constantly and I'm afraid I'm afraid he's becoming absolutely dependent on me for as his emotional touchstone for everything. I mean, you don't understand. I like a good I like a good attaboy. I like a good pet. I like a good, good scratch behind the ears once in a while. But this is constant. So this, they weren't looking specifically at people who have their own therapy dog that they're with all the time, which I'm sure the dog would be super happy about being with that person all the time because that's their owner, that's their life partner, that's their world. Yeah. They were looking at these dogs that go into group therapy sessions and help shy people to open out about their problems and all this kind of stuff. And... So these people are these dogs are meeting strangers almost every day and going into situations where those strangers have some sort of problem and it turns out for the most part does not bother the dogs at all another reason dogs are amazing as long as they're getting positive attention it sounds like they're good to go the one caveat to that is that if they were stuck on a leash sometimes stress hormones did go up. So if they didn't have the freedom to move around as they wanted to or, a, or away from these people, go get water, go pee, whatever, if they didn't have the freedom to do that, that would stress them out. But if they were off leash, they were totally fine. No stress whatsoever. Dogs are awesome. They're just so perfectly evolved to be with us do what we need so that they can get what they need from us. It's astounding to me. I love it. Yep. Yep, that's all I have. Are you ready to go to the break? Awesome sauce. Is it that? I think it is that time. Yeah. Uh, do we have to, do we, what do we normally say when we go into the break? Oh, I remember. Stay tuned for more This Week in Science. Yes. And then we have music. And now, I'm going to do an ad. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 150,000 different titles in a variety of genres. Twist has found many science-based books in the Audible library. You can start a free trial today and get any audiobook download for free and support Twist at the same time. All you have to do is sign up at audiblepodcast.com slash twist. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist now for your free download. Twist also has merchandise you might enjoy. Head over to twist.org to buy some of our swag. We now have a link on our website that goes directly to our Zazzle store. So go to twist.org and click on that Zazzle store link in the menu bar to start buying now. Twist is supported by listeners like you. Your donations pay for our hosting, bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, and fun things we try to do for the show. We appreciate any amount. $2, $5, $10, $100, $1,000, $1, $1,000,000. $1, you make this show possible. We currently accept donations a couple of ways. First, we have a PayPal donation button on each of our show pages on our website, www twist.org, that's T-W-I-S dot O-R-G, or second, we have started a Patreon account at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience, which is kind of like Kickstarter for media producers, where you can get stuff in return for your donation. Whichever your preference, go to the website, listen to the most recent ep episode, comment on the show, and make a donation. Can't afford a donation? We can always use your help to get more people listening to and watching twists. Use your social networks for science and tell people to tune in to This Week in Science. We thank you for your support. We couldn't do it without you. And now we're pretending there's music until Justin gets back.
And we're back with more This Week in Science. Hooray! Justin, what else do you have? That was it. That's all I've got. That's all I saw. Oh, That's wait, no, true. I have another one. <laughs> uh, this is out of the University of Adelaide. Uh, researchers have discovered that stem cells taken from teeth, teeth can grow to resemble brain cells. Teeth That's, in my brain? That's, that's right. Suggesting they could one day be used in the brain as a therapy, perhaps to regenerate brain cells lost from a stroke. The, University of, uh, the University's Center for Stem Cell Research laboratory studies have shown that stem cells from teeth can develop and form complex networks of brain-like cells. Though these cells haven't developed into fully-fledged neurons, researchers believe it's just a matter of time and the right conditions to get it to happen. Uh, a quote here from Dr. Kylie Ellis. She's the commercial development manager with the university's commercial arm. Uh, stem cells from teeth have great potential to grow into new brain or nerve cells, and this could potentially assist with treatments of brain disorders, such as stroke. In reality, uh, the, the reality is treatment options available for thousands of these stroke patients every year are limited, she says. The primary drug treatment uh, available must be administered within hours of the stroke, and many people don't have access within that time frame because they often can't seek help from someone at the time, uh, for some time after the attack. Ultimately, we want to be able to use the patient's own stem cells for tailor-made brain therapy that doesn't have the whole host rejection issues commonly associated with cell-based therapies. Another advantage is that the dental pulp stem cell therapy may provide a treatment option available months or potentially years after a stroke has occurred. Wow. So far, this is, of course, uh, being done in mice, uh, right. with mice teeth. That's still pretty freaky. Some teeth in your brain. <laughs> right? Well, the, you know... I know, they're not actually teeth. They're not actually putting teeth in But it's but, still in my... But in yeah, my head, the idea is you're putting teeth in there. Yeah. Which is kind of true. <laughs> well, regardless of where it comes from, I think, I think the, the, other, the other aspect of this... I mean, a lot of this is developed for therapies. Mm-hmm. But then, like, who couldn't use a few more neural connections? Mm -hmm. So that means I could, if I wanted stem cells, an easy way to do that is to have one of my teeth pulled. Yeah. That's pretty sweet. Save Just save it. Save my wisdom teeth, right? Yeah, That's before, what I should do. Before you lose all your teeth, I guess, right? before all your teeth are gone, you may want to find a way to preserve them. Could you use the baby teeth? That would be great. Use your baby teeth. Yeah, I don't know how long. I don't know how long you. I don't know how. How long bad. they're good? <laughs> yeah, I don't know how long they're good for. So but, maybe we should just be taking our wisdom teeth when they get taken out, I having see. them cultured into stem cells, and then keep those in some sort of safe deposit box for later. I didn't lose mine. Mine came in because I, I have a big enough mouth <laughs> that they they fit just fine. Well. I have a pretty big mouth, but apparently not big enough. <laughs> what, uh, what else is going out there? Oh, uh, there's more traces of water on Mars. This is... Uh, more? More, right? So this is the southern hemisphere of Mars is home to a crater that has very well-preserved gullies and debris, and it's showing uh, debris that's in the form of flow deposits, the Geomorphological attributes of these landforms provide evidence that they were formed by the action of liquid water in somewhat geologically recent time. Uh, the geologically recent time frame, somewhere between somewhere. Okay, so they they figure the age of the crater itself uh, is is helping to date this. The age of the crater itself is approximately two hundred thousand years. Oh, uh, that's it. <laughs> well. Means that okay, it was it, it was formed after what they think may have been an ice age on Mars, which ended around four hundred thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. Now these seem like really long time frames, but as we were talking about in our last story, this all occurred in the pretty much in the days of the Neanderthal. 
Mm-hmm. Right? So Neanderthal is running around Eurasia looking up at Mars. Maybe Mars was a little shinier. I don't know. What would Mars look like if it had an ice age? Maybe it looked a little different. Right? But and, and so there would have been water flowing in this crater well into the 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 run of Neanderthal. So somewhere somewhere between 200,000 years ago and now. Uh, it says gullies are common on Mars, but ones which have been studied previously are older. The sediments where they have formed are associated with the most recent ice age. Our study crater on Mars is far too young to have been influenced by the conditions that were prevalent then. So this suggests that the meltwater related processes that formed these deposits have been exceptionally effective also in recent times. Hmm. What's recent times? Yeah, that's within the last 200,000 years. So the cuz the ice age would have ended about 400,000 years ago, you could have had evidence of thaw out stuff going on then, but this is saying it stuck around. There was still flowing going on. Wild. That's much more recently than I I thought that we that there would have been flowy water. If you were telling me this took place, you know, 60 million years ago, it's like, oh yeah, long, long time ago. Mm-hmm. Water moving out. Or, but you know, 200,000 years or sooner, that seems awfully recent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very recent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. What else you got? Uh, I th- I've got the word. Oh, well, there was one other thing, wasn't there? You go ahead. I'll go track down okay. my errant missing story. I mainly picked this story for the name of the article that was published about it. There's safe B in, num- in numbers. There's safe B in numbers. <laughs> I couldn't even say it. Bummer. Take two. There's safe B in numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Bees, bumblebees, can distinguish between safe and dangerous environments. And on top of that, are attracted to land on flowers, popular with other bees when in a dangerous environment. So first of all, the scientists trained bees to differentiate between safe and dangerous environments. By doing, how, did, how they did that was, when a bee landed on a flower associated with danger... Foam pincers would trap the bee and prevent it from foraging, which simulates an attack by crab spiders, which is very common. And uh, I apologize for the crab spiders that will be in all of your dreams tonight. Crab spiders lurk on flowers to catch pollinators, and they can camouflage like a chameleon. They can change color to blend in with wherever they're sitting. Uh Sorry, everyone. It's not bad enough that spiders are creepy. They also can... Some of them change colors to blend in with their environment. That's really cool. Yowza. But so the crab spider hides on the tip of these flowers, blends in with the pollen, and then when a bumblebee flies in, they grab it. (laughs) So they use these foam pincers that didn't actually hurt the bees to train them what is a dangerous environment and what is not a dangerous environment. In the safe environments, the bumblebees chose to feed from flowers at random But in dangerous environments, the bees always specifically flew to flowers that were occupied by other bees. And the scientists related this to if you're walking through a bad neighborhood, you're more likely to choose a busy street where there are lots of other people around than a deserted street to get to your destination since the chances of being attacked are lower. I don't know if that's why you pick a busy street in your head, but this is, I guess, what's happening underneath is there's more people to A, witness what's happening, but B, more people to potentially get the attack than you. Right, and it's so there's safety in numbers, I get that, but it also could be more like the area may appear to have been vetted, right? Like Yeah, there's that too. Uh, okay, if there's other bees there and they're not getting attacked, then chances are this is safe. There's other bees that have, you know, buzzed ahead <laughs> and not, and not uh, gotten taken down, so it's, it's probably safe. Right. There's all of that, for sure. And they avoid being eaten in, in many ways, but mostly, yeah, they're getting the information from the bees 
because if the bees are there, it's probably safe, but also, yes, there's strength in numbers. They want there to be more opportunities for them not to be the one getting grabbed. Normally, they'd spread themselves thin, minimize competition, but when it's dangerous, self-preservation wins out over getting more pollen. Pretty cool. And Blairla has frozen. Blairla's to see frozen. how long distance migration works with disease transmission. So would you expect if there were animals that were infected? Oh no. You're back. You're back. Hello. We have a time delay now though. We have a lag. Okay. Oh no. You're there. Um, everything is cool. everything's, everything's okay. under control. Well, anyway, so scientists used a model. They designed a model to look at how long-distance migration affects disease transmission. Now, if you were going to guess, if I was a monarch butterfly, and if there were some sick ones, would migration make disease spread farther, or would it reduce disease, disease transmission? What do you think? I think it would reduce disease transmission. Why? Because uh, in migration, there's more distance between uh, the butterflies, and therefore they're less likely to pass it on to each other. So you're exactly right. Most scientists have thought... You outsmarted the scientists, Justin. Of Most scientists would have thought that that's actually going to spread it farther, because in the in the process of migration, they'll run into other communities converging at the new point at the end of the migration, and they'll spread the disease to other animals. But in fact, what's happening is, not only does it reduce the proximity in between animals, so there's less likelihood to spread it amongst themselves within a community, but additionally, additionally, it weeds out the weak ones. So all of those butterflies, like Justin's showing you on his pillows, if some of those were sick, they might not make the difficult migration. And in fact, that would stop the disease from spreading, huh. which is pretty wild. And it's important to know because especially with monarch butterflies, their migration routes are being disturbed. Devastated. Devastated, disturbed, changed from climate change. They're getting hit from all different angles, and their migration is thrown all out of whack. And so in, some people are planting milkweed close to them so that they don't have to migrate, so there's still food during the winter. And so they're trying to figure out if that's going to affect them adversely, which it looks like it might, because when you take migration out of the picture, it's going to change disease transmission. And in fact, yeah. it's looking like it's going to move diseases around the individuals a lot more. So that's something to keep in mind looking forward. Migration is a good thing. It weeds out the weak ones. It also creates distance in between all of the individuals. So actually, it's a plus for halting disease transmission. Pretty yeah. interesting. H human version of this is the Oregon Trail. Right. If you hit the Oregon Trail and you were ill, you didn't make it to California. That's right. Yeah. Uh, or Oregon, or maybe... Danielle Oregon. died of the red fever. Mm-hmm. On the way. Lose and people, a turn. People, people out in California didn't get sick from you because you were never there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You were too weak to ford the river. You died. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I found my last story. So this is uh, this is uh, more more science being done uh, with the help of mice. These mice researchers. I'm surprised there's not. I, I, I'm surprised there's not more mice in science. Hmm. So working together, John Hopkins biomedical engineers and neurosurgeons report they have created tiny biodegradable nanoparticles able to carry DNA to brain cancer cells in mice. The team says the result of their proof of principle experiment suggests that such particles loaded with death genes might one day be given to brain cancer patients during neurosurgery to selectively kill off any remaining tumor cells without damaging normal brain tissue. In our experiments, 
Our nanoparticles successfully delivered a test gene to brain cancer cells in mice, where it was then turned on, says Jordan Green, PhD, an assistant professor of biomedical engineering and neurosurgery at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. We now have evidence that these tiny Trojan horses will also be able to carry genes that selectively include death and in cancer cells, or excuse me, selectively induce death and in cancer cells while leaving healthy cells healthy. This would be an amazing, amazing development. One of the problems, that, one of the, when, when cancer metastasizes, when it gets into the brain, one of the big obstacles for traditional treatments is getting past the blood-brain barrier, for one, and targeting directly anything the brain uses is exceedingly difficult. This, if this proof of uh, principle, proof of concept, flushes out, could be a, a huge weapon in the war on cancer. Wow, that is awesome. Right? I love it, little Trojan horses. Right? Someone in the chat room wants to know what the nanoparticles are made of. Uh, let's see. It does not give me a descriptor, or mm. does it? Let me see here. Mm. And Kevin Unique in the chat room says, really, really small things. <laughs> they are, well, that is correct. That is 100% yep. correct. They're yep. really, really, really small. A plus. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, they used, it says they used uh, dozens of different types of particles and tested their ability to carry and deliver a test sequence of DNA. Uh, but it to the hemispheres, but it does not give me hmm. here what was the successful one. Hmm. Interesting. Well, that but, uh, would be a fantastic way to get this kind of stuff done. Actually, it does look like his the lab itself, the lab uh, where it's uh, this work is being done, specializes. So it's, uh, so it's specialized in producing tiny round particles made up of biodegradable plastics. Mm. So it may be, it may be that dissolves when it's done. Right. So maybe that they're experimenting uh, with different different formulas of uh, of the the plastics, uh, biodegradable plastics, to see which one of those works better. Mm hmm. Interesting. Okay. Do you want to hear? I have a couple more uh, headlines before we finish up. Yeah. Um, so they found a cartwheeling spider. <laughs> Morocco in Morocco, uh, Sebrinus rechenbergi, <laughs> which lives in the sand desert of Ergchebi. Wait, say um, that again. Seb Sebrinus rechenbergi. I just wanted to hear you say it again. Sebrenus rechenbergi. <laughs> it's the first species of spider documented to project itself across the sand through cartwheel-like motions. And I would love for you guys to all check this out on the YouTubes. I'm going to try to screen share it right now, see if you guys can see it this way. But it's here, there's a, they have a robot that they're trying to train to do it as well using the same mechanics. But this spider is really wild. It's really just doing cartwheels across the sand. <laughs> so they just found it. They're trying to figure out all sorts of stuff about it, why it does it that way, how it does it that way. But it really just looks like it's falling downhill, but it's projecting itself. It's pretty wild. Yeah, it looks like it's getting blown by the wind. I wonder if that's how it figured it out. Like a tumbleweed. Right? Like there was like a good wind along and it was just like, oh, wow, oh, geez, oh, gosh, oh, oh, hey, look, check me oh, out. This is that. <laughs> oh, this yeah? is actually kind of, oh, yeah, I got it now. I'm feeling it. I can do this. Yeah, I'm going out. I'm traveling everywhere like this from now on. Yeah, it does kind of look like it's jumping for joy, right? It's pretty funny. So they're really cool. Check that out. Uh, hopefully we'll have some studies with them coming out soon about why they do that. Um, then also, the secret, uh, secret of 
deep diving seals has been discovered. They use carbon monoxide for good. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Carbon monoxide is a poison in our bodies. It's something that we get from smoking cigarettes that can mess up our bodies pretty bad. Well, it turns out that it restricts blood flow and reduces cell damage um, when elephant seals deep dive. Hmm. So apparently when an elephant seal d dives, they're basically holding their breath for a long time, sometimes over an hour. And when they come back up, when they breathe air again, the rush of oxygen could cause tissue damage, it could cause cell bloating, it could cause all sorts of problems with blood flow. And the carbon monoxide has a protective effect so that it keeps inflammatory problems from happening after breathing oxygen again. And so recently there's also been laboratory research on rats and mice where they found that carbon monoxide has anti-inflammatory properties after organ transplant as well. So it looks like we're starting to figure out exactly how these animals can hold their breaths for so long and carbon monoxide is a part of it. It's pretty cool. Um, so th it gets pretty technical. I don't, I'm not going to get too much into it, but essentially the levels of carbon monoxide in the seal's blood was comparable to that of someone who is smoking more than 40 cigarettes a day. <laughs> but it has therapeutic benefits in the elephant seals. So pretty interesting. That does not mean cigarettes are good for you. It does not mean we need carbon monoxide. What it means is that these seals use it to help them when they're holding their breath for a really long time. It could be figured out how to use for humans, like I was saying before with the rats and the mice, after organ transplant in some sort of anti-inflammatory property. But that's still very much to be determined. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just trying to protect myself from oxygen. Right. right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there was that one. And then the very last one, not related to animals, only slightly related to science, but Leonardo da Vinci may have created the first ever 3D image, and that image was the Mona Lisa. <laughs> now, now uh, forgive me, Blair. For uh -huh. my art history may not be as extensive as that of others, but it seems to me a 3D image would have been created by perhaps a statue maker. Of <laughs> That's not an image, that. Justin. Oh, oh, you mean like a 3D? A flat thing that looks to be 3D. Oh, so if you put 3D glasses on and you look at the Mona Lisa? No. No. You better there is. Them. There is a copy, or what they thought was a copy, of the Mona Lisa in Prado, in Madrid. Which actually, I, I have seen before. Yeah. And it's it's actually nicer than the original. It's actually, yeah, it's, it's like less a little, battered, for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a little crisper. It's a little nicer. So new research indicates it was probably made at the same time but it's from a slightly different position. And the distance between these two perspectives is very, very close to the distance between a person's two eyes, which you could use to create a stereoscopic 3D effect when you combine the two. So if any of you have seen stereoscopic pictures, some of the very first 3D pictures, you kind of put on these funny glasses that are basically blinders, and at the end you have two pictures suspended on the end of those blinders, and it creates something like a 3D image. So the background of the, this Mona Lisa copy was black, but it, if you scrape it away, it's the exact same background that was in the original Mona Lisa, but it's from a slightly different angle as well. Everything in the picture is from a slightly different angle, but it looks, it's the angle makes it the exact right angle to make it a stereoscopic image. So it's possible that da Vinci invented the stereoscopic image, AKA the beginnings of the 3D image. Okay, and you know, you, know what I, you know what I think, you know what I think this is? I don't think this is, uh, I've already got a theory. 
of what, what happened here. I don't think it was an attempt to make a stereoscopic image. I think it was, I, I bet you anything, will, it was it was Leonardo going, okay, I want to do this right. But you ever, it's like you take your kids into, you go, you go into her for a photo, anywhere, you go in for, to get, have a picture taken anywhere but the DMV, and they will take more than one picture. Right. So they can, you know, get one that's, that's the good one. So I can picture Leonardo having two canvases. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to do the eyes over here. I'm going to try it again over here. I'm going to do this over here. I'm going to move over here now, and I'm going to do that same segment over here. And his paintings may have come out almost identical, except they would have been as he shifted back and forth between the two canvases, taking the the two shots, the two two portrait sitting. Uh, would have shown up from a slightly different perspective. Well, these scientists believe that this one was done by a student in his studio, like a apprentice, which makes a lot of sense also, if you're going to do it that way. And so it could have been totally an accident. However, da Vinci did write about monocular and binocular vision before, studied aspects of optics, mm -hmm. and experimented with colored light sources. What we're not clear about is if he ever put all of those things together and did this intentionally. You know what would be interesting? You know what would be interesting? Is to go back through the... I thought you were going to say to go back in time. <laughs> we, that would be next. That's my next thought. That's actually, you're ahead of me. Wait, did we already go back in time? Are you from the future? I sometimes you can be. So yeah, I'm, I'm from right now, and now. What and I'm now. what what I'm. And now. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm wondering is if we could if we go through the the archives of Leonardo uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, creations and experiments or apparatus, if we'll find some kooky viewer that seemed like oh he tried to build a binocular but it was slightly askew and it didn't work. I wonder if I wonder if somewhere in there is an invention of a viewer where you could put the two paintings some distance away and watch them and see that stereoscopic vision. Mm -hmm. uh, that yeah, clever. I don't know. It's apparently it doesn't make an absolute perfect stereoscopic image, but it it would make sense as a first or second try. Not everyone accepts that both images were made by. Leonardo, it's possible that that one is just a copy and not a great copy, and that's why it looks that way. Mm. But all of those things being better. coincidental it really does look better. Seems unlikely. So for that reason, I like to think I think it's pretty cool. Out of all the things that Leonardo da Vinci figured out, it makes sense to me that he might have figured out stereoscopic images. Well, is it is it that the whole image isn't is it just not line up, or is it just uneven in the copy? I mean, if it's all from a different perspective, slightly in the copy, uh -huh. that's a weird copy. Yep. Because exactly. at some point you're like, oh, yep. well, no, you can see this in the background of the original. Yeah. So I got to be able to see that in the background of the original. If you're covering uh -huh. everything ever so slightly in one direction and revealing everything ever so slightly in some other perspective or direction. Yep. That's kind of hard to be a copy. Then at that point, you're kind of yeah, take it. I think he just did two exactly. versions. I think I think it's all Leonardo. There was no student. Well, if you look, and now I closed it, so I have to open it back up again. Oh but if you God. look at, they did a, an, a rendering of what the setup looked like, mm -hmm. and they used Playmobil figures, which I love. I think it's hilarious. But like I'm going to screen share this, too. If you look at how they had to be standing, mm -hmm. it doesn't look accidental. Because if you just had your student standing next to you, the, he'd be next to you. Yeah. But he's not exactly next to him. He's actually in front of him and slightly overlapping. Interesting. And a comfortable position for a student to copy you would be next to you and far enough apart from each other that hands could be moved without bumping into one another. Oh, so if I'm, you look at how yeah. they're standing, this looks pretty intentional. Unless, unless you're Leonardo da Vinci and you have a brush in your left hand and a brush in your right hand and are 
going back and forth and doing both paintings, one a left-handed painting, one a right-handed version, which he was capable of doing. He could do this. And he could write backwards in one hand. He was ambidextrous. He was ambidextrous, but he could also, like, write different things at the same time with each hand. He could do all kind, and what, he could write backwards if he wanted to, and it would complete the, it would be right. I mean, he was <laughs> that insanely more intelligent and functional of a human than has walked the earth since. I think he did both paintings at the same time now. I don't even think they were, yeah, I think he did, I mean, I think he did one left-handed and one right-handed. You think he did it intentionally, too, uh, to be a stereoscopic image? I kind no, of do. I, I still don't. I still don't know if I, I will go that far, but I do think he was like, ah, the last one I did, I wasn't happy with. I'm going to do two versions this time. I'm going to see, maybe it was an experiment. I want to see if it comes out better left-handed or right-handed. And I think the one that they think is the copy is because it was the better painting, and he was like, you know what, I'm keeping that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to give the other one to the client, yeah. but I'm keeping that one because I did Well, that. apparently he had students paint alongside him pretty often. Mm -hmm. That's pretty well documented. Um, and the differences between the two also make experts in this sort of thing think that it was painted by two different people because of certain things with brush strokes and right, left handed and right handed. Stylistic, right. yeah, sure. You know, why not? Stylistic so, looks slightly different. That could be it. Sure. <laughs> and the experts also thought it was a copy for the longest time. All right, what are the ex art experts? Let's get the scientists involved. Mm -hmm. That's a brilliant story, though. I love it's that. pretty cool. It's kind of sciencey. All right. so, thought I'd throw that out there. What else do you have, Justin? Anything else? That's it. I think we've and I think we've used our allotted time yeah. frame and then some for the uh, regular broadcast. Join All us right. later for the after show broadcast. Yes, first shout outs. Shouty Blair is gonna do some shout outs. Uh oh. This is gonna get loud, people. There's lots of Patreon supporters and I'm gonna say all of their names. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Rudy Garcia, Ryan Buen, Colby Ooh. King, Savannah Ooh. Cummings, Salison.10, Ali Smith, Richard Allie. Van Der Hack, Rich. Alec Doherty, Joe Alex Wheeler, Alex. Eric Joe. Cook. David yeah. Barger, David. Simon Lagos, Simon. Matthew Litwin, Matthew. Jason Dozier, Jillian, Jillian. Eckland, Nick Jillian. Bradwell, William Lozano, Lou Zampini, Bruce Cordell, Jillian. Anthony Leonard Perez, Michael Walden, James J. Roscos, Philip Atherton, and Thomas Makinen. Thank some you, of the everybody. Most awesome names I've ever heard, too. I know. None, so of our, none of our Patreon donors have boring names. It's They're true. All awesome. So cool. So, those are my shout outs. <laughs> Does that make, hang on, i got to bring up the thing right then. I say so. On next week's show, once again, we'll be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live where you can watch and join our chat room. But don't worry if you can't make it. You can find our past episodes at youtube.com slash thisweekinscience or twist.org. Don't forget to tell a friend about Twist and to check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Also, I want to shout out that the short about plants has <clears throat> dropped. Woo! It is on our YouTube page. It is also all over our various Twitters, which... Uh, we're going to tell you all about in a second. So go to twist.org and check that out. Go to youtube.com slash thisweekinscience and check it out. I did it at the Exploratorium with Kiki. It was super fun. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have a mobile device, you can look for Twist for Droid in the app, uh, app in the Android Marketplace or Twist, simply T-W-I-S, in the Apple Marketplace. For more information, oh, wait, that's a, go ahead. Uh, for more information, on anything you've heard today, show notes will be available on our website, www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners as well. I'm going to steal this one now. Mm -hmm. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line so your email doesn't get spam filtered into oblivion. You can also ping us on Twitter, where we are at 
Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address or a suggestion for an interview, anything at all, please let us know. We will be back here next week, and we hope you'll enjoy, uh, join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything at all from the show today, remember... It's all in your head. Then, then we dance like this music playing. Yep. Mm -hmm. But we're horribly off the beat because we can't hear the music. But it's okay. I dance for me. I have to plug in my computer. <laughs> plug in your computer. We are now in. We are now in the uh, often uncharted waters of the after show. So I'm going to put in the chat room right now mm -hmm. the link to the short. It's right there. Okay, so everybody watch the short with Blair. I am going, I'm going to go dive down and commune with some seals for a moment. Right. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, the short, those of you who have seen it, um, just to give you a little background on it, um, obviously it's not like the best version of a twist short ever. It's a good start. And basically Kiki and I were just trying to figure out if this was something that we could continue to do. So it was easy enough. It was simple enough. I think that we are going to try to continue it, um, not on a regular basis. We're just kind of waiting to be inspired by stories. So when a, a good story shows up, we will work out a nice short again. So that's kind of the plan. And my laptop is not charging, so that's not good. So that means my computer is going to die. You say not charging. That's not great. Oh, there we go. Good. So, anywho, there's that. Um, let's see. Uh, it's super warm in San Francisco, like a million degrees. I'm going to turn my fan back on. <sighs> um, I don't know if we would be going to SeaWorld. I think you guys will have to step up your Patreon support in order for us to get to SeaWorld. Um, that is quite a trip. But we definitely want to do... We have a couple things in mind for all of us to do together. Um, well, Whiskey Renegade, you thought it would be longer, but it's a short. <laughs> we're not trying to make full hour-long canned things. Really, we were aiming for three to four minutes, and that's pretty much what it ended up being. Um, I don't really think a canned, scripted thing like that is going to be YouTube friendly, internet friendly, etc. at more than four minutes. I don't know. Maybe you guys disagree with what <laughs> we were thinking. Sorry, I'm blinking a lot because this fan is drying out my eyes, but it's a very warm, so I have this fan on. You wanted more. <sighs> <laughs> Habituate. Yeah, I've, it's definitely some of my day job leaking into that. I left my work and took an extended lunch to go film that at the Exploratory because it's about a 10 minute walk from my work. So I was very much in child teaching mode when I ran over and did that. So that explains some of that. Yeah, Kevin. See, Kevin agrees with me. 34 minutes is pretty much all you can 
do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, I mean, if you guys liked it and we get good viewership, then we'll definitely be able to keep making them. We just have to make sure to have it be worth our time that we spend on it. Um, I didn't see any outtakes, uh, Strength, so <laughs> I probably don't want to. <laughs> I don't know how many there were, really. We kind of just did it a couple times, and we're good to go. Yeah, I, Ed, I agree. I think three to four minutes is pretty much as long as it should be. So I think that if Justin and I and Kiki go do something remote at a certain place, which I don't think we've talked about on air, but no, if we go do that, then that probably would be at least 10 minutes because we do a whole tour of the area, right? Oh, I think it would be longer than t uh, 10 minutes. Yeah, like between 10 and 20, I'd assume. Yeah, easily. Yeah. Easily. yeah. There's a couple. I mean, there's a couple locations too. I don't know. I, I think I'm guessing which one you're talking about. The place, like the, there's oh, a place yeah. in Davis. There's a place in Davis. Yeah. So that one. That one. Uh, I mean, potentially with that location, we could do that location partly as though it were an interview. Uh huh. And we could also do the show from there. Oh, that would be so sweet. Yeah. I'm real. I'm trying that, to get. That, there's a lot like, of. It sounds the, like you're in a wind tunnel right now, Blair. Yeah, I turned the fan back on. No, so, you got to turn the fan off. You can no, have the power I'm on, but the fan warm. is too much. You got to turn it away from you. It's but then it's not doing anything. You sound like you're doing a weather report. From... It's real windy here. Right. Uh, <laughs> Wait, did it sense. sound like Suggest... that in the microphone? Did it sound roboty in the microphone? No, it's no. It sounded like I'm here during the tornado <laughs> season. It's real windy. It, it's sounding. We can hear it. So, uh, Kevin, you <laughs> suggest we do a TED Talk. I, I would have nothing to add to what those people have said. Wait, what? Uh, I'll do a TED Talk. Ooh, yeah, you know, no. I do have a TED Talk in me. I, there is a TED Talk I would love to do. How to talk about science like you know what's going on? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. I would love, I would love to do Love you. A, what? <laughs> I would love to do a TED Talk about John Dewey and the philosophy of education. That would be that. Or I, actually, I, I take that back. I would love to see somebody much better qualified and much more intimately uh, knowledgeable and passionate about John Dewey to do a TED Talk on John Dewey. Um, but well, but the, the lacking other... that existing on planet Earth, I would love to do it. The other thing I really want to do that would be kind of like a remote canned thing potentially, which this is what we're still trying to figure out. There's a couple locales that we would really like to do a show from that most likely we cannot broadcast live from. Right. So, it would so be the question is, episode. yeah, would I mean, chat room, how would you guys respond to that? Would you freak out if we didn't have a live show one week and it got canned and released instead like a couple days later? I have another suggestion of how we could do it. What? We could, we could do it... Uh, I mean, it, ultimately, I want a higher production value than we have. And it's, yeah. not, it's not that I want better cameras. It's not that I want better mics. I want a little more integration. Because what I think would be mm -hmm. really fun to do on, uh, on, on, on something like a remote location where we go and tour a facility or a, a place that's doing something interesting is do the canned version, uh, but in segments. And then the three of us would do our normal riffity riffs live. Not quite Mystery Science Theater 3000, but, um, you know, be able to do part of it live. And while we're watching a segment, you know, the segment plays, it's canned, the audience sees it, and then we're back live, audience is asking questions about what we just put on the air and we could respond to it in real time. That would be mm -hmm. a brilliant thing. Interesting. Yeah. So I'd have a canned three minute thing where I explained a study and then we'd all talk about it. Right. Mm -hmm. well, well, no, no, I don't mean so far as like changing what we do now when we, when we show that, do these things. That's like a next level up because that's then like each of us going up solo reportering and then bringing it back to the mind hive for the live show where we do the speculative stuff. But but I mean, if we were to do a location scene 
like even if it's the three of us together. Mm -hmm. uh, and do a presentation, and then because the questions that come up, you can present something like like just happened in the previous study. What was the actual substance used? And it does look like it was a uh, a, a plastic that they they used to mm -hmm. to deliver the DNA segment uh, to the metastasized cancer. Uh, but those are those, to be able to get those questions and perhaps answer them while this while you've just watched the segment because there's part of I mean, I almost also think there could be a version of this show where we watched Nova and did Mystery Science 3 or 3000 to it. You know what I mean? I mean, we part of our content in this show is the science news, but the other part of it is what's really alive. I mean, the delivery stuff, getting the message out there, maybe would be better canned. You know, maybe would be better polished. Uh, but then the, you know, sort of riffing on it or joining the audience and questioning or pondering about things is what is, is to me part of the more interesting part of the show sometimes but that's the part that has to be live that's the that's the real uh, audience interaction part and us interaction part more so than just delivering the story yeah I don't know it's something to explore for sure but I like doing these little shorts to start kind of just playing with some of the more produced elements and seeing how it fits. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was telling the the audience um, while you were away doing your mysterious going on diving. that um, I think the the short came out really good for a first ever short, but I think that we have a lot of growth potential. And we've definitely seen like what works and what doesn't work. <laughs> and I love how enthusiastic you are about the future of Twist, uh, Blair, because it's, uh, it's after nine thirty. Uh, it's my bedtime. But so anyway, um, I think I'm really excited to go out there and do it again, and and you know use what I've learned to kind of adjust and all that kind of stuff. I'm just waiting to be inspired by a story or a topic um, because. I'm letting it happen organically. I don't want to do it for something just because it's time to do another short, you know? So I'm waiting. You're waiting, but there's also there's also something that, I mean, uh, doing this show, there is something about the deadline that makes you delve into things a little bit more and look for the stories and... And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, Thursday, I got to have, you know, four or five stories put together, uh, ready to talk about. Got to find them. Got to, you know, look, read a little bit. So, so. It, and that's how I found the plant story, and that's right. why I got all excited about it. So I'm still looking every week, yeah. and I'm waiting to be struck by another one that 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 lends itself well to the format. I mean, that was perfect because it was about this plant that folds and we could go play with those plants in real life. And I think that was a lot more of a, of a great way to talk about that than to talk about it in this show and just be like, hey, there's this plant that folds. You guys actually got to saw, see how when you touch it, it folds. When you blow on it, it folds. It's a whole different experience. Um, and so that was, you know, I think that was perfect. And I think that there's some stories that lend themselves to this format, and there's some story that lend themselves to the produced short format. And I'm waiting for one to hit me kind of across the face that's good for the short format again, I think. And it would also be nice to have, uh, instead of me doing fake quotation -y voice when I'm speaking in the voice of a scientist who said something, to actually be able to get them recorded yeah, exactly. and just play it. Yep. There's a lot of there's a lot of potential stuff that we could be doing if we were organized and funded. <laughs> you know, then again, more money, more problems. You know, it's all. It's yep. all. Yep, yep. Well, you you have anything burning you want to talk about? Because I have to wake up at five, so I'm probably gonna get going pretty soon. Oh well, in that case, I will I will let you go. Uh, minions, okay. minions, thank you once again for for joining us for another twist travaganza. Uh, we will see you again next week, same time. Sorry guys, after show short and sweet, but hopefully this time next week I'll be broadcasting to you guys from Atlanta. What? 
Yeah. We'll talk about it off air. But um, I'm 90% sure I'll be able to be here. Um, I'll just have to be here from Atlanta. <laughs> good night, Blair. Good night, Minions. <laughs>